This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. To our repeat customers, hopefully this show is your own personal cheers bar. To our first timers, here's what we've got on tap. In today's show, we'll take a look at what some elected officials are saying about federal agents cracking down on protesters. Plus, the coronavirus could be the impetus for a renaissance for creatives within TV production. But first, here's what you need to know right now. A big step on the long path toward a working vaccine for COVID-19. Today, a vaccine candidate became the first to enter phase three of its trial in the U.S. A woman in Georgia received the first dose. Either way, it's, it's a really important role to have mm -hmm. and to be a part of that research. Mm -hmm. And I, I never thought that I'd do something like this. Roughly 30,000 adults will get two shots 28 days apart. Some volunteers will get a placebo for comparison. Researchers will monitor the effectiveness and safety. Moderna and the National Institutes of Health developed the vaccine. Moderna is one of the companies to get funding through the U.S. government's program to accelerate vaccine candidates. And let me stand Mourners across the country are paying their respects to a civil rights icon. Over the weekend, the body of John Lewis was carried across the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the final time, giving us this iconic shot. Lewis was beaten by law enforcement on this bridge in 1965 while demonstrating for voting rights. This week, Lewis will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol before moved to the Georgia State Capitol Wednesday. He's remembered as a congressman and a giant of civil rights who spent a lifetime fighting for racial justice. Lewis died at the age of 80 on July 17th. Protests against police brutality and for racial justice continued over the weekend in at least six cities across the country, with multiple attacks on protesters ending in death or injury. In Aurora, Colorado, someone drove a car into a protest on Interstate 225 on Saturday, injuring two people. In Austin, an armed protester was shot and killed after another altercation with a motorist who was also armed. Meanwhile, tensions have been boiling over in Portland where protests have continued since the death of George Floyd two months ago. On Sunday, the protests started peacefully, but by one in the morning, federal agents in Portland declared the demonstration an unlawful assembly and fired tear gas and flashbangs to break up the protests. Today, Portland police said their officers weren't involved. The federal agents patrolling city streets during protests have been in focus as of late. While the Trump administration has deployed federal law enforcement to curb demonstrations in several major cities, some elected officials have been rejecting their presence and even making their own threats against the agents who harass protesters. Newsy's Jamal Andrus has more. Federal agents continue to clash with protesters in Portland, Oregon. And renewed rage over police violence spurred more protests in cities like Seattle, Austin, and Louisville this weekend. And while the Trump administration is facing multiple federal investigations and several lawsuits, advocates and district attorneys are raising the stakes by threatening to press criminal charges against federal agents. That's a violation of state and local law. Miriam Krinsky, a former prosecutor in California, now works with city prosecutors across the country to provide support and enact criminal justice reform. When you see them harm members of the community, when you see them tase or use impact weapons with members of the community um, who aren't engaging in force and pose no threat in their own right, that's an assault. Despite this criticism and potential legal action, Trump administration officials show no signs of changing course. No one would question their right to prosecute that law enforcement officer who in the case, you know, tragically of George Floyd, you know, for over eight minutes um, took someone's life away um, in full public view. We don't question the right of a DA to engage in that circumstance nor should we question their right to equally protect citizens of their community when a federal agent is engaged in the exact same conduct. Acting DHS Secretary Chad Wolf tweeted over the weekend, criminals assaulted federal officers on federal property and the city of Portland did nothing. It's important to mention while the president has alluded to federal officers and to civil unrest in cities like Chicago and Baltimore, these officers are not supposed to have any interaction with protesters. I've drawn a very hard line. We will not allow federal troops in our city. We will not tolerate unnamed agents taking people off the street, 
violating their rights. District attorneys Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore and Larry Krasner in Philadelphia penned an op-ed warning President Trump and his administration against sending officers into their respective cities. We strongly believe that the actions in Oregon are illegal. Should the president proceed with his plan in our cities, his agents will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Krinsky says DAs across the country are following the events in Portland and could echo State's Attorney Mosby and District Attorney Krasner's threats of prosecution if federal agents have any contact with protesters. They're very concerned when they see what's happening in Portland. They're very concerned when they listen to some of the words of the president um, about what he intends to do. It doesn't mean that they're going to be rash, but I think it also means that they are not going to be silent and they are not going to simply um, you know, sh shrink into the background when these things are happening in communities that they have been elected and sworn to help protect. According to the Washington Post, the Trump administration has plans to send even more federal officers to Portland as protests continue to grow. Jamal Andrus, Newsy, Chicago. When we're back, we'll look at how the coronavirus is throwing its own curveball into the MLB season. I'm not sorry for that one. We take a step away from the noise and spam to really hear the stories that need to be told. Newsy cuts through. Ah, uh, sure. Memes and cat videos are fun, but actual news might be a bit more useful. Follow Newsy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get straightforward, opinion-free news right on your social news feed. Consider this next section the second team of what's going on in the world around us. Here's what's trending. We're not even a week into the very weird shortened 2020 baseball season, and we already have a team hamstrung by a COVID outbreak. The Miami Marlins have now had 14 staff members test positive, including eight players and two coaches. Despite that, the team did play Sunday's game against the Phillies, though tonight's Marlins game back in Miami was canceled, and the Phillies will postpone their next game as well. It's bad for baseball, but it's also bad for the return of sports in general if leagues can't keep cases isolated, which, as they're learning, is not an easy thing to do. Target is joining Walmart and closing down stores on Thanksgiving Day this year. Keeping stores open on Thanksgiving has been a point of tension for a long time now between those companies and labor advocates. This year, Target and Walmart say employees should spend their holidays with their families. Though, before we start thinking this is out of the goodness of their corporate hearts, also consider in-store shopping has been way down this year for obvious reasons, with customers opting to shop online. Both companies are trotting out special online deals for Thanksgiving. And that's the end. And the internet is wishing a very happy birthday to legendary Looney Tune and black culture icon Bugs Bunny. Bugs turns 80 today, and people are sharing some of their favorite moments with the cartoon rabbit online. Well, that's season. That's season. For my generation, Space Jam kind of dominates the conversation. But there's a lot of Looney Tunes history out there, including some not so great stuff. But after eight decades, Bugs is still kicking, and we're still giving him new shows like this new collection of shorts streaming on HBO Max. Now that's what you call staying power. The coronavirus has shifted how we live, how we play, and how we work. And that goes for folks within the TV industry, too. Newsy's Casey Mendoza spoke to an Emmy award-winning production designer who says the pandemic is creating a renaissance for VFX and virtual production companies. Welcome to Nailed It! The amazing performances. I love it! Recognize these stages and sets. They were all designed by Emmy award-winning production designer James Pierce Connolly. He's worked on shows like The Masked Singer, The Voice, and Nailed It. During Comic-Con at home, he talked with Newsy about how a variety and reality series are going to look post-pandemic. I own a design studio. I design um, variety shows for a living. I probably do between 25 and 30 a year. With the pandemic hit, we obviously hit a little bit of a slowdown, but then what you don't realize is everyone needs good design right now. Everyone needs solutions. 
Some of the biggest solutions needed for future TV productions involve complying with social distancing guidelines, having fewer people on set, and doing away with studio audiences. What I hear as a designer is, I need to redesign the desk for all the judges. Everybody needs to be six feet apart. We need to design solutions for audiences over and over and over again. But ultimately, what we're, what, what's netting out is, is we cannot reveal that we're in a pandemic. To better navigate the challenges, production designers are using augmented reality and virtual reality to avoid physical sets as much as possible. With this technology, Connolly is already building sets for the next season of Fox's The Masked Singer. This is a major renaissance. I mean, I've had multiple conversations with VFX houses and animators, for instance, because they can tell stories without a lot of people on site to create a production. Casey Mendoza, Newsy, Chicago. I'm going to jump online and look for one of those helmets from The Masked Singer. They were truly ahead of their time. There's three American girls competing for the top two Olympic spots. I could go into this and come out with nothing. Some schools across the country are looking to reopen this fall, and the EPA is pointing to recommendations related to air filters to protect students, teachers, and staff from the coronavirus. But as Newsy's Mark Greenblatt reports, tens of thousands of schools still need upgrades to make that happen. With schools nationally facing pressure to reopen, plans to social distance and wear masks are being adopted and rolled out. But even with those added precautions, there's another looming threat air filters. Tens of thousands of American schools need upgrades to air conditioning systems that blow air throughout classrooms. And most states have yet to adopt the latest national recommendations to help protect children and staff from COVID-19. Ventilation rates in part are intended to lower the, the levels of bioeffluent or in, in lay terms body odor to the point that most people will think the air quality is acceptable. Dr. William Bonfleth chairs the Epidemic Task Force at ASHRAE, the Professional Engineering Society. It developed MERV, a widely used rating system that assigns air filters a value between 1 and 16. The higher the number, the better filtration. 8 was the old recommendation for schools. Good enough to stop large particles from damaging equipment, but not to protect against bacteria or virus, which can still get through. Epidemics are were not really uh, incorporated into the thinking. Air filtration has been a growing concern since the CDC linked a COVID-19 outbreak in China to a single restaurant with poor air conditioning and ventilation. Now the new recommendation for schools to safely reopen is filters with a MERV 13 rating or higher, and many places are not ready. We have a MERV 7 or 8 filter in every single one of our schools. Chris Farkas is the operations director for Hillsborough County Public Schools in Tampa. So we're literally going system by system with an engineer. What can this system take? How hard is it to flip a switch from a MERV 8 filter the old way and just put in a new MERV 13 filter? It isn't, a, it isn't a difficult. It's more of a cost for the filters. Each upgraded MERV 13 filter can cost twice as much as the lower rated kind, but it doesn't get out of control. A typical elementary school might pay $1,500 more in order to get the better filters. You switch them all out four times a year, that's about 6000 bucks. If we can move to a MERV 13 and not have to replace the air conditioning system, it is 100% the easiest thing to do and one we will do. So when you have an older, antiquated system, as we have in some of our schools, so it's going to make the air conditioning break down more often. A GAO report from last month estimates 36,000 out of the nation's 100,000 public schools need updates to their air conditioning systems. So for older schools, Farkas says parents nationally can still push school districts to explore alternatives, like standalone air filter units or other localized options that can bring more outside air in or just clean the air better in specific classrooms, even if there's added cost. I would rather spend the money to keep my kids safe. I'd rather have my son's uh, school safe to do that um, than to try to justify why we couldn't afford it. Mark Greenblatt, Newsy, outside Washington, D.C. We've been counting down the days until the election, 99, and election security experts are worried. They believe much more needs to be done to ensure a safe and efficient voting process this year. 
Newsy's Sasha Ingber has more. Election security experts are painting a grim picture of where the country stands less than 100 days before the general election. Newsy spoke to experts in areas where the largest vulnerabilities lie as the coronavirus pandemic poses new challenges. We started with mail-in voting, an option that many Americans may take out of safety concerns. We are in a store for a lot of chaos and confusion on election day if we don't take quick action. The $4 billion that election advocacy groups have called for hasn't been allocated by Congress to states. They are making choices about whether or not they're going to provide um, postage for vote by mail ballots or whether or not they have the money to send mail ballot applications. We also have some states that are extraordinarily rigid in a way that has been found to be discriminatory about how they actually count the mail ballots that they've seen. Something else we may not have enough of, election workers who tend to be over the age of 60 an at-risk population for the coronavirus. We're going to need hundreds of thousands of new poll workers to volunteer and serve our democracy, not just on Election Day, but also for early voting and for processing of mail ballots. That's going to be a challenge. Polling sites themselves will be tested on November 3rd. The number of polling sites that are appropriate is much less than what we've seen in the past because we need sites that are large enough that can accommodate social distancing. And when it comes to the country's general election infrastructure, items like voting machines and databases with voter information. We really have just done the bare minimum and not really tackled the difficult uh, security issues that really need to be addressed in this country overall. We still have states that are uh, using very old machines that are outdated, machines that are running outdated software that don't have security updates. We also have machines that still don't produce a paper ballot. Cybersecurity experts say states and localities have taken significant steps since 2016, but they often fall short. This is really basic stuff, like making sure you've got all the security patches installed on your systems, making sure you have decent passwords, using two-factor authentication, and from an attacker's perspective, that's the low-hanging fruit. It might be that with all the publicity of Russia trying to tamper with our elections, other countries might want to get in on the game too. You know, why should Russia have all the fun? The last question Newsy asked of a disinformation expert, how prepared are we for an onslaught of falsities on social media? And there, a hint of progress. I think we are, as a society, better prepared in 2020 than we were in 2016. Part of that is the social media platforms. They're definitely trying to identify foreign operations and developing policies to um, dampen some of the more domestic operations as well. The efforts to manipulate us are going to be more sophisticated in 2020 than they were in 2016. But my hope is that we were so naive in 2016. Um, at the platforms were naive, individuals were naive, our government was naive. I think we um, are all collectively more sophisticated ourselves. Despite the enormous obstacles, states continue to prepare, some making strides and others hoping time will allot them some fixes. Sasha Ingber, Newsy, Washington. I'm a middle child, so I'm used to not getting much attention. But you could change that by hitting us up on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. That's the only shameless plug you'll hear from me today. At Newsy, we're focused on facts and solutions. Talking with medical workers on the front lines, decision makers, and everyday people. All of us fighting COVID-19. Newsy, be informed, not influenced. TikTok has been in the news a lot lately, and not for the above-the-waist dance routines. The Trump administration has targeted the app, claiming it could be collecting information on behalf of the Chinese government. The app was created by a Beijing-based company. But as Newsy's Tyler Adkison reports, TikTok operates a lot like other apps you may use on a daily basis. TikTok is facing heightened scrutiny from the U.S. government over privacy and security concerns. Would you recommend that people download that app on their phones uh, tonight, tomorrow, anytime uh, currently? Only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. President Donald Trump ran several now-removed Facebook ads throughout July claiming China and TikTok are spying on its users. 
Newsy spoke to cybersecurity experts about TikTok's data collection and privacy practices. They told us that TikTok operates similarly to other tech companies. According to TikTok's privacy policy, they collect common things such as your name, email address, and IP address. You know, these are common things, common data points to collect. You will see that many applications, you know, Facebook, Google, what have you, collect this. But they also collect some questionable information. You know, most importantly, one thing I found was they collect geolocation related data, so GPS tracking. TikTok isn't alone in this practice either. Companies like Facebook also collect GPS data on users who opt in, according to their data policy. Majera told Newsy that TikTok's policies are designed to show TikTok isn't mishandling personal information of its U.S. users. They host their primary data in the U.S. and outside the Chinese law. Chinese law is what allows the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, access into their data. So according to TikTok, they don't even have access. He noted some of TikTok's data practices have left people skeptical about what they actually collect. In 2019, the company paid a $5.7 million Federal Trade Commission settlement for collecting personal information from children without parental consent. Now, TikTok states they do not sell the personal information to third parties. And if that's true, that's commendable. But you know how they plan to use their data they collect in the long term remains to be seen. President Trump's ads also claim that TikTok was caught red-handed monitoring iPhone clipboards, the place that stores data that's cut or copied. That can include passwords or personal messages. Newsy reached out to Misk, a company that discovered the clipboard vulnerability. In a statement, co-founder Tommy Misk told us their research only confirmed the act of reading the content of the clipboard and said the behavior is indeed suspicious but does not qualify as spying per se. Misk said TikTok was not alone in this practice and that they found dozens of apps read the clipboard frequently and for no clear reason as of late June, including several US-based news apps, mobile games, and shopping outlets. Majera added that some of the data that TikTok collects compared to other brokers is pretty limited and could be obtained from other sources. If TikTok is collecting six, seven, eight data points, you know, those are good data points. But at the end of the day, if they really want data, they can create a company and buy data from these data brokers that would be way more comprehensive than anything that they can collect from TikTok. Majera also told Newsy that this TikTok moment should also serve as a reminder that before you download any app, scrutinize what data they want. If you download an application that tells you the weather, for example, you know, and it says it needs access to your location, that makes complete sense. But if it says it needs access to your camera or to your phone contact list, why the heck does it need access to that? It probably doesn't. Tyler Adkison, Newsy, Chicago. We're still months away from a coronavirus vaccine, according to health experts. But scientists are discovering new ways to treat medical issues found in patients suffering through the worst of COVID-19. Newsy's Lindsay Thies explains. Scientists are investigating whether CBD, a chemical compound from cannabis plants, could fight inflammation in severe COVID-19 patients. The cytokine storm is when the body's immune system attacks itself, and it's been linked to the deadliest COVID-19 cases. People who are also in cannabis field are also trying to find the right strains for COVID. Dr. Olga Kolvachuk is a cannabis researcher at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. She's part of a team who believe they have ID'd some cannabis strains high in CBD that could help treat the inflammation that comes along with the cytokine storm of some coronavirus infections. She says not every high CBD strain was effective though. Terpenes are important as well as other minor cannabinoids are also important. Another study from researchers in Georgia found CBD reduced inflammation and protected lung tissues in COVID-19 patients. So far, all of that CBD COVID research has been done in models, animals, or replicated human tissue. Now, to be clear, scientists that Newsy spoke with say this doesn't mean you should be planning a trip to the dispensary. Much more research is needed, including clinical trials in humans, like ones that might combine CBD with other antiviral treatments like remdesivir. Any antiviral therapy probably does like 90% of the job or 80% of the job or 70% of the job. We may not doing 100%. And what we're proposing, maybe CBD can do what is left over with that. Dr. Siddhaba Baira Reddy is a researcher in pharmacology and experimental neuroscience professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He says getting funding is among the challenges holding back cannabis research. 
Some labs are even raising their own money. The FDA just released guidance this week outlining how companies seeking approval of drugs that contain cannabis or its derivatives must follow the traditional drug review and approval process involving clinical trials. The agency is still working on CBD-specific rules. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, Denver. That's it for us, gang. No matter how today turned out for you, you get to level up again tomorrow and then catch us for more in the loop. Same time, same place. But don't dip just yet. More top stories from news here headed your way right now.